It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Saturday, the National Day of Hate. I didn't start, I didn't I didn't make that up. The National Day of Hate brought to you by neo-Nazi groups across the country. And yes, yes, they're planning on big events. Uh, New York, Chicago, cities across this country where the 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 neo Nazis come out and uh, yeah, I, I pledge their support to uh, I don't know what we do know. Anti Semitism is going to going to be high on Saturday because uh, they're supposed to be dropping banners and uh, pla- placing stickers all over the place, plastering walls with with flyers, scrawling graffiti. You know, wherever they can graffiti. <laughs> and you go, you know, this is what I love about the country. Uh, I love the fact that crazy people can do crazy things as long as they don't hurt others. As long as you're not screwing with somebody else, as long as your rights don't infringe on somebody else's. Yeah, go ahead. Have your have your little Nazi rally. I, at least that's my thinking. Now, don't be surprised. And this is, the, I guess, the world that I grew up in. You know, have your little Nazi rally. Have your little, you have like Forrest Gump. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, hey, have your little party. Have your little party. Go do your thing. Until you, until you, do something to someone else. Now that when that happens, now there are consequences. Uh, I had a bunch of people today say, well, you know, it should be National Punch Punch a Nazi Day. I go, you know, I'm not against National Punch a Nazi Day if they deserve it. You know, if they're peacefully assembling, if they're doing their little thing, if they're doing their little thing, whatever that is, being angry with each other and whatever it is Nazis do, uh, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. It's when they start doing Nazi stuff. <laughs> that's when that's when I have a problem with this. And the sad reality is, is there's there's a, a political party in this country that has been been courting the Nazis for a very long time. Look, you go back to, back to Pat Buchanan. You know, the joke back then was, you know, his speeches were much better than the original German. So they've always courted this, this, you know, this formerly underground secretive bunker group uh, who are now, you know, very much vocal, you know, going, we're going back to the, the parades in the streets. Yeah, you go back to you know a hundred years ago when they were doing this because we're going to take down those civil rights and things. Um, yeah, so we're we're going back to these these displays, and for me the it, it got me thinking about got me thinking about my my high school government teacher again, and you know it's one of those those moments where you go, I remember re- learning about the Federalist Papers, and Federalist Ten to be ex- to be specific, which talked about factions. I mean, we had, you know, Marjorie Trainwreck, you know, with her, we're going to have a national divorce. Um, this is exactly what the founders were afraid of. They were afraid of, of the, this kind of breaking, breaking apart. And look, Madison believed that, that factions were, were inevitable. Uh, because look, human nature. You know, we're, we all have different ideas. We all have different opinions, different beliefs, you know, different, you know, stations in life, you know, different you know, levels of you know, property and wealth and you know, whatever. All of the ways that you can divide us, we're different. You know, you name it, we're, there are ways that we can be sliced and diced and pitted against each other. And ask the wealthy. They know exactly how to do it. As long as we, you know, are different. And as long as we hold different beliefs, um... We group differently. We we form alliances differently. We you know, we want to, and this is where you know segregation happens. We we go around like-minded people, hold similar ideas, similar beliefs, go to the same churches, you know that kind of stuff. So you know, as we we group up, we create these factions. Now, this is one of those things that that Madison was was concerned about, uh, because you know, he they understood 
that was going to happen. Uh, he said, you know, basically we can we can do a couple of things as people as people go into these factions. Uh, we can break we can break them up. Um, we can we can try and control them, but neither are a really great option. And the thing is, is we're going to get into our little groups. We're going to find our our factions, and sometimes these factions are going to work against, you know, common sense, against public interest, uh, and yeah, sometimes they're going to infringe on others' rights, which is why you need to have a strong central government. This is the reason that the Federalist Papers were, were arguing. You need a strong federal government to, you know, to, to hash out these, these moments. The idea of minority rights. And as he pointed out in Federalist 10, there are two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction. Uh, he wrote one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. Uh, he said there are, again, two methods by removing these causes of factions. One, by destroying the liberty, which it is essential to the existence. And two, the other, uh, giving every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Uh, the second, he said, was expedient, is in, impractical, and the first would be unwise. And I agree. You're never going to control the passions, the ideas, the, the, the values of everyone. So you got to figure out how we're going to, in this big melting pot that I used to learn about as a kid on Saturday mornings on Schoolhouse Rock, in this big, big melting pot, we got to figure out how we get along. Now, the sad reality is you've got the, the Marjorie Terrader Greens and, and that, that group doing everything they can possibly do to push these factions to the maximum. And look, we are being, we're being fractured. We're being sliced and diced. We're being pushed into these factions. And look, the Republican machine... Honestly and truthfully, you have to give credit where credit is due. They're masterful at this. You know, there's they, they say there's a master's course in how to do some things. They've got the PhD level division going on. And you see all of this stuff going, you know, the culture war that they've pushed to the extreme. They keep force feeding us all of this nonsense. So why? Well, corporate America and the wealthy can continue to rob us blind and exploit us. And it's it, for me, it's it's really that simple because you look at the comments coming out, you know, you name the topic and you look at the 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 the, the alignment of, of a number of people and you find out where the where the factions are. Follow the money. It's simple. For instance, I look at Tennessee. Here's a perfect example of using virtually a non issue. To, to raise insanity, to raise people's blood pressure, to keep force-feeding the outrage candy. Understand, Tennessee is the state with the 11th highest poverty rate. Child po poverty, even higher. And what are they spending their time doing? Are they, are they figuring out how to maybe get to 12 or 13 or 14? No, no, no. They've decided that they're going to pursue legislation to ban drag shows in public and and sex changes for minors so no more no more no more of this stuff now look here's the thing we can have honest conversations about whether you should have drag shows for children and and sex changes and which personally not in favor of but they're masterful at pushing this issue because it's almost non-existent for for the vast majority of people but they take that one little kernel that one little grain of sand and man they can blow it up they can make, well, what's that thing, a mountain out of a mohill? Uh, this is what this is. Now, I say all the time, you know, Democrats lose these fights often because they get into paragraphs. You know, they're explanations and they got to explain and it's just long drawn out. It's, it's simple for me. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You have the right to do what you want. Just like the Nazis can hate anyone they want to hate. I'm not going to get inside their ears and try and figure out how they're going to like somebody. Don't care. It's when that hate then turns into driving a car into a crowd of people or shooting people on the, on the, or beating people or the things that we've seen our Tiki Torch friends do. But this is, again, one of these moments where Republicans are masterful at the, at the, at the messaging. Well, I don't know anybody who wants their kids to sit and watch drag shows. But is that in any school district that you are around? The answer is no. There may be one or two, and boy, they blow this out. 
And as far as the sex changes for minors, I can tell you one thing I know for certain, and this is something conservatives used to believe. I don't want government telling me what, what I'm going to do with my children in a very delicate situation. I don't have all the answers, but I know the one thing I don't want. I don't want a government of zealots, especially zealots. The Glenn Youngkins of the world, for instance. The Ron DeSantis's of the world. The Greg Abbott's. I don't want them making decisions for anyone. And this is where conservatives, use, true, true conservatives, who understand their ideology, this is where they used to, yeah, we don't want government making those choices. Because when you, when you make a broad, no, none of this, ever. When you make a law that is basically a, a, a hammer, everything's a nail. And there's so much that, that we don't know about, about this. So, so for me, I go, you know, the parents who are the advocates of the children, they're probably the best to, to help make that decision with doctors who are informed and psychologists and psychiatrists and all the people along this process. That's probably where that should be. Now, should the professions you know, be a little more cautious? Maybe. I don't know. But again, I know one thing. I know that I know I don't, I don't want government deciding these things, especially with a, a across-the-board blanket kind of law that's meant to stifle all anything because this is what Republicans do well. And then, look, they do it masterfully. Give them credit. They are fabulous at, at taking kernels of reality and blowing them in. They're, they're, they're masters at taking the exception and making them the rule. And this is one of those moments where you go, it's, it's about time that you, me, us, start, start pursuing this life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And look, I know a lot of people are going to be mad, and I'm going to get a lot of hate email. Rick at the RickSmithShow.com, please, uh, please make sure you get the, get the address right. I'm not against the Nazis marching. I think it's better to know who our Nazi neighbors are so that we can shun them, so that we don't have to deal with them, so that when they're nice to our face, we know their true natures. For me, that's the reality. I want to know who you are because when you tell me, I'm going to believe you. And this idea that, well, he's a good Nazi. I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. So for me, we've got to break down these factions. Because the idea that Madison had was, by having all of these factions, and, and we want to encourage them, but by having them, they, they have to compromise. They have to come together. There has to be some unity. So to hear Marjorie three names go off about a national divorce, you know, another civil war, Makes me know, one, she's never read the Federalist Papers. Two, she knows nothing about the Founding Fathers who were, who were afraid of this, which is why they weren't into pure democracy. And three, minority rights are important. I mean, we went through uh, you know, the, the McConnell years of him you know, preaching about minority rights. In fact, we're still hearing about it in the filibuster reform. This is a moment where we can be true to our ideals, and still hold people accountable. Now, I understand police in New York and Chicago and major cities across the country will be on higher alert on National Hate Day. And understand, if this is, this is now who we are, the rest of the world is looking around going, you got Nazis. Um, there they are. Question that comes to me is, you know, who's going to invade our country to help fight off the Nazis? Interesting times. I want to hear your thoughts. So email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I'm going to take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. For working people, come to talk. I'm J.D. Scholten with Courier News, and I'm here to tell you you're probably getting screwed. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle in the early 1900s. The popular fiction book was based on things he witnessed when he spent seven weeks in Chicago touring the stockyards and the slaughterhouses and interviewing the community. Sinclair hoped to bring attention to the plight of immigrant laborers, whose working conditions he believed amounted to wage slavery. Most readers, however, instead fixated on his descriptions of the rotten meat filled with toxic chemicals dirt, dust, and rat droppings that went out for sale. He famously remarked, I aimed at the public's heart 
and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Over a decade later, President Woodrow Wilson ordered the Federal Trade Commission to investigate the industry from the hoof to the table to determine any wrongdoings. The FTC reported the Packers were manipulating markets, restricting flow of foods, controlling the price of dressed meat, defrauding producers and consumers of food, and crushing competition. In 1921, the Packers and Stockyards Act passed in Congress to prohibit unfair or deceptive practices, giving undue preferences, apportioning supply, manipulating prices, or creating a monopoly. And that was the last time the meat packers did something wrong. Just kidding. Fast forward to almost 100 years later, and today the meat packers are more concentrated than they have been in any point in US history. And during the pandemic, the farmers were getting squeezed, workers were were working in dangerous situations for low wages, consumers were paying the most they ever have for meat, and every single meat packer around this time posted record profits. Then last week, the US Department of Labor found that at least 102 children from 13 to 17 years of age were employed in hazardous occupations and had them working overnight shifts at 13 meat processing facilities in eight states. The largest penalties went to JBS Foods in Grand Island, Nebraska, JBS Foods in Worthington, Minnesota, and Cargill in Dodge City, Kansas. These kids shouldn't be working in dangerous situations or working overnight shifts. They should be in high school. The total fines for 102 kids working was $1.5 million. In 2021, JBS made a record $65 billion. 2022, Cargill revenue jumped to a record $165 billion. And Tyson Foods ended that year with a record revenue of $53 billion. Do you think the $1.5 million fine is going to deter these monopolies from continuing to use child labor. Welcome back to the Rick Smith show. Now here is Rick Smith. So I just happened to check the Twitters during the break and uh, Dan Quayle is trending on Twitter. Remember, come with me if you will. For those of you old, old, old enough to remember, um, you remember when misspelling the word potato was enough for voters to go, nope, too dumb to be president. Remember that? Ah, uh, the good old days. Yeah, I, I, wow. You know, anything anything I said bad about Dan Quayle from 1988 to 1992, uh, I, I'm sorry. Wow. I you know, I knew I knew the GOP was was bad. I knew they were heading in the wrong direction for a very long time, but wow. Wow. Uh that said, Mike Pence is nearing the decision. Mike Pence is on on the way to making his decision whether he's going to run for president in 2024. And let me be the first to tell you, he doesn't st stand a snowball's chance. Um, nope. Nobody, nobody, nobody likes Mike Pence. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Now, interestingly enough, Pence came out and declared his support for the war in U our, our reaction to the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, went on to rebuke fellow Republicans uh, who have... Uh, How's a good way of putting this? I'm not going to go that they're taking Russian propagandists' money, but it sure seems a lot like it. You know, I'm not going to say that the people over at the F Channel aren't don't have a direct line to the Kremlin, but it kind of seems like it. It kind of seems like mm, there's a lot of people on the right who are, and and some on the far left too, who are uh, who are siding with Putin, which is bizarre to me. Um, it is because, you know, this is just one of those moments where you go, eh, I don't know. I don't, I, I thought the Republican party was better than this, but you know, it is, it is where they are now. Mike Pence going to maybe announce, maybe he's going to announce during CPAC, uh, cause he's not going. So maybe this will be, Hey, I've made up this big thing. I haven't decided I'm not going to CPAC. Maybe that's when, when he will, uh, when he'll jump in, uh, no, his, his president. Donald Trump. Trump's got a plan to end the war in Ukraine. He's he's got a, he's got a plan. His solution, here it comes, cuz he says he could do it in in 24 hours. He said he would get people in a room, he'd knock heads and get it done. And I'm going, "Hold on a second. Uh that get her done thing, that's somebody else's. That's trademark infringement." Uh I definitely know he's not bright enough to come with what put that just saying. Now, Mitch McConnell has come out and said that uh, it's time for the U.S. to wake up. 
wake up to the threat that Russia poses to the rest of the world uh, here as we, we go towards the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine. And, and I had a bunch of people, you know, jump on the, the, the MTG train. You know, we need to know where each and every dollar of our tax dollars is being spent. And look, I want to know that our tax dollars aren't being wasted and aren't going to oligarchs and aren't, you know, lining the pockets of nefarious characters. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. But here's the thing. This is why you have security clearance. This is why you run committees. This is the reason that we hire representatives to go in and look out for us, not to get attention, uh, not to, you know, not to you know, say, hey, look at me. Because I started thinking about it today. I go, you know, think about, you know, back before World War II. Now we had some, we had some, you know, bomb throwers. Uh, we had some people who were against the war, but they were against the war for. Well, I think of Jeanette Rankin from from Montana. She was against the war, World War One and World War Two, just because she was a pacifist. But you had the Bush, you know, the Prescott Bushes of the world, who were making lots of money off the Nazi war machine. You had that that group, that America First group. Uh, you know, those 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 business types who are going, hey, you know, we're making a lot of money off this. Let's not rock the boat. I get that kind of feel here. That, hey, we're making money off Russia. You know, let, yeah, let, let them go. You know, they're, that's, they just want Ukraine. They're not going to go anywhere else. Which is interesting because I had a listener send me a thing saying that, you know, as a percentage of GDP, the United States is not giving the most money. Because we give a lot of money because our GDP is so big. Um, but he sent me the, the the Council on Foreign Relations report that shows that we're actually fifth as a, as a measure of GDP. And and you go, well, who are the other the other ones? Well, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, then us, then Bulgaria. And you go, huh, let's see. Uh, for those of us who didn't fail uh, <laughs> geography... Uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, that's kind of like a straight line. That's kind of like, wait a minute, that's the next step a after Ukraine. Uh, it's in their interest for Ukraine to do well because they know it's them next. And Bulgaria as well. I mean, they're all right there. And, you know, and we're, we're there. And why, why would we be interested in this? Well, because the reality is once those states fall, once those countries fall and we, we reconstitute the good old former USSR, but this time not in a communist model, this time in a capitalist communist model where we have communist like dictators over a free market system uh, that has no problem with slave labor and capitalism. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Now, what's interesting is, you know, some military experts that I've listened to They've said that we better hope Ukraine does well and stops Russia because if they do go to Poland, Russia cannot compete with NATO. Uh, there's no way Russia will win a ground war with NATO forces. There's just not. Uh, they're just not that good of a military. They just don't have that kind of fighting skill. They usually just throw people. The fact that they've lost over 100,000 soldiers in one year, let that sink in for a minute. They've lost over a hundred thousand in one year, and you know we spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time talking about how many people were, were killed during the Vietnam War, and you go, mm, you think about uh, what was it like fifty two thousand, and that was over several years. You think about in one year, you had this many, over a hundred thousand. Kind of makes you go, maybe, maybe there's a problem. Um, yeah, over a 10 year period, we lost 53,220 soldiers in Vietnam. That's over a 10 year period. In one year, they've lost 100,000. And you think about every war that they've ever been in, they've never lost more than less than, what, you know, five, six hundred thousand soldiers. So if this happens, if, if Ukraine goes down, they're going to go into Poland. There's there's already there's already documentation. There's already you know plans in place. There's Putin's already said this stuff, and what that means is that NATO has to get involved. And I hear people, well, you know, they shouldn't get NATO involved. No, this is where NATO has to get involved. And why Ukraine wanted to be part of NATO 
you know, a national self-determination. And the reason that I support it is not because I'm pro-war, but because you've got to take on bullies. We're a country that takes on bullies. We don't protect the dictators. And it's interesting that you got someone like Trump, you know, a bully who seems to always acquiesce to the bullies. You know, his his true love over there in North Korea. And that 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 guy in, in, in Moscow with that display in Helsinki, that's our tough guy. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Ricksmithshow.com. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is, though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And after years of politicians talking about it, they finally passed a big new infrastructure package to rebuild roads and bridges, fix drinking water systems, and make the energy grid more secure. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice as Americans. We are AFGE. We support our nation's military and our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders and provide services to our nation's seniors. Across the country and here in Washington, D.C., the American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Before we close the program, we want to take a moment to thank our viewers and to share a little bit about why we do what we do. At The Rick Smith Show, we believe that media today is almost entirely controlled by corporate greed. So we have now 24-hour news channels. But instead of 24 hours of news, what we get is one hour repeated 24 times and with, with tons of commercials creating obscene amounts of profits. Information once presented as a public service has now become a private commodity. So when lies make money, lies... Lies are what we get. We get a corporate-controlled rage machine feeding us anger and hate, trying to convince us that our problems are right-left or red-blue when they are and always have been up-down, the wealthiest 1% versus the rest of us. Our goal is to be an alternative to that machine, not as a news show with a fancy journalist out front, but as a talk show run by a union truck driver, and a team of working-class heroes just like you. Everything we do, both what we get right and what we get wrong, is dedicated to advancing the interests of America's working families. No corporate ad buys, no think tanks, no focus groups, no talking points. We are media by working people for working people. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time. <music>